Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, it is a pleasure uh, to be here to receive João Figueiredo here at SES and to have you all here. Uh, this is a seminar that is part of a series of seminars from the project uh, UNPOP. The project UNPOP is Unpacking Populism, Comparing the Formation of Emotion Narratives and Their Effects on Political uh, Behavior. Uh, so the, the, the UNPOP project explores our narratives of emotion allow a deeper analysis of the way populist phenomena constitute and influence political behavior. With us, as I said, we have today uh, João Figueiredo. Uh, João is from the Nova School of Law. Uh, he's a researcher that is working in a very interdisciplinary way. And today he is bringing us uh, uh, a talk with, uh, which is called Sizing the Emotional Infrastructure of the State. Lessons to be learned from the Portuguese colonial psychological actions. Uh, as I said, João, uh, he comes from the anthropology, but he has a PhD uh, in advanced studies of story. Um, and he has researched uh, in uh, different areas, uh, moving between uh, <laughs> more conventional, more traditional topics of history, having been uh, researching more recently uh, in the, this crossroad between legal pluralism and history, and is moving uh, next year to the University of Munster, but for now he's here with us, and I'm going to give you uh, the floor, okay. and if you want to add something to your presentation, no. you're very welcome to, uh, to do it. It's perfect, Sally. Thank you. Thank you for introducing me, and thank you for being here. We know that it's a, a complicated time of the year to, to have an audience because the exams are over, and you're either done with them or you have to correct them, as you said. <laughs> so thank you for all for, for, for all of you being here. Now, I will begin uh, by briefly introducing you, no, not me, but my, my topic. So I came across this, uh, this psychological operations manual and some of the pamphlets that they were distributing in the Lundas in, between 68 and 1972, while I was actually researching uh, about, um, about the Dungo Museum and colonial collections for this debate about restitution and everything. And as I hope you, I will have time to show you in the end, some of these pamphlets uh, show an image of a chokwe mask. So, uh, a couple of years ago, I came across this archive, and I've been dying to have the opportunity to explore it uh, in, in greater depth because I find it fascinating. We keep in the public debate, we keep discussing Portuguese propaganda, we keep discussing myths like prosopopicalism, and we keep discussing what to do with this with this inheritance that we have. But I think that we keep missing these two points: that we also inherited the, the, what I call here, following Alberto Toscano, an emotional infrastructure. And also, we keep not giving credit to these psychological operations officers for the work that they were doing. Credit not to say that they were doing something great, but we keep dismissing them as if, um, as if this was not planned, it didn't take an effort, and it was not cutting edge, I would not say technology, but yet yeah, they were integrating a lot of theory, a lot of thinking in what they were doing. So when we are up against this, when we're trying to decolonize or to free the public space from, this, from the myths that come from this era, sometimes we think that this was an amateurish work that just simply uh, emerged from the interaction of people in their daily lives, but no, looking at these manuals, looking at psychological operations, we are forced to confront the fact that this was planned, and I think that in the process we get to know better our enemies, so to speak. So, I will begin, I do have a presentation, sorry, I need to put the, the PowerPoint on. Uh, so, I will begin by introducing what I call a null hypothesis, uh, something that you have in statistics, so something that I will disprove, but I think it's a good starting point. And my null hypothesis that I presented yesterday is that uh, Portuguese propaganda was white magic. Now, in 1962, in the wake of the armed nationalist uprisings that had taken place in Angola, in the north of Angola, Perry Anderson, the, the brother of Benedict Anderson, wrote a series of political essays for the New Left Review that he entitled Portugal and the End of Ultra-Colonialism. In the second part of the series, he stated that, and I quote him, Portuguese colonial ideology, like its counterparts elsewhere in the continent, is a systematic falsification of reality. As such, he continued, it is of little more interest than any other imperial mystique. However, he concluded, it is at the same time a highly distinctive ideology. In Anderson's opinion, 
what set Portuguese ideology apart was that more than any other, it was what he called an exercise in pure magic. Therefore, according to him, what was truly impressive about it was not its bizarre cosmology, but the fact that the method that the propagandists of the new state, Estado Novo, employed to circulate the propaganda was, according to him, the classic instrument of magic, incantation. I have his quote. Uh, I think I'm going to just leave it there for the video for you to read and just continue with, with my presentation to save some time. After downplaying the originality and the practical and social relevance of the bizarre cosmology under analysis, Anderson pinpoints two tropes that grounded the semantics of Portuguese colonialism, justifying the primordial principle of its pan-continental territorial unity. According to him, the first, the first myth was the myth of Brazilian racial democracy and exceptionalism, a trope that since the 30s, lusotropicalist theorists amplified to include the African colonies of the Third Portuguese Empire. This myth proposed an answer to a riddle that baffled social scientists throughout most of the 20th century. So this was giving an answer, this is why the myth was so good catching on. Namely, what troubled the thing that needed explanation was what Marvin Harris describes as the Latin American lowland race relations, defined by the absence, and I quote Harris, of sharply defined racial groupings, like both the Latin American highlands and the United States. So the problem was that you could not explain why in Brazil you had this carnival, this profusion, this baroque profusion of racial categories, while in the US you had a one-drop rule and a rule of um, hypo descent. So if you have one drop of black blood, you become black, otherwise you're white, and this is a simpler system. It has close parallels with, uh, with, uh, with apartheid, so social scientists understood it and knew it was bad. Now, Brazil, since you could not understand it, you, you, Nobody was quite sure, is Brazil good? Is Brazil the answer? Is Brazil the future? Maybe, we don't know what's happening in Brazil. So, Brazil constituted a riddle throughout the 20th century, and, um, and its baroque system of nomenclature, as, as Patrick Wolf describes it. So, losotropicalism comes as an answer. And since you don't have any other answer for it for a long time, it just sticks there. Now, the... Um, According to Anderson, the second trope, or the second myth, is what Valentin Alexander defines as the myth of the herança sagrada, sacred heritage. Anderson quotes the propagandists of the new state regime to explain that this myth invoked uh, the ancestral memory, in a quoting, of an astonishing gallery of discoverers and builders who moved by a sacred impulse carried to the ends of the world our ships, our dominion, and our faith. As he clarifies, this trope allowed for the economic and the development that was responsible for the state's failure to achieve the normal imperial pattern, and this is the expression that he uses, which I find problematic, but you know, this myth allowed this failure to be recast as a moral victory, and for the Portuguese ultra-colonialism to be represented or presented to the audiences as an anti-capitalist, anti-communist, imperial third way. So, since we were so poor, we were clearly not capitalists, but definitely not communists, so this was a third way, a third way imperial project. The fact that both myths were ideological antiques inherited from the liberal monarchy and the early decades of the Atlantic abolitionism, so since the 1836-1840s, led Anderson to conclude the Portuguese propaganda system was primitive and unsophisticated, like the ideology that it circulated. We can interpret this conclusion as either a naive reading, or more convincingly, as a politically motivated attempt to debase and demoralize Portuguese propagandists and fascist intellectuals while rallying, su rallying support and sympathy for the anti-colonial liberation movement. So I don't believe that Anderson was this naive. I think that he was on purpose calling uh, the, the fascists um, underdeveloped. In any case, Anderson's description of Portuguese colonial ideology and the system that circulates it provides us with a useful starting point for exploring what we can be described adopting Toscano's concept as the emotional infrastructure of the Portuguese state, an infrastructure that we inherited from the new state regime. First and foremost, because by stressing that both the syntax and the semantic content of the bizarre cosmology that was disseminated by Portuguese propaganda were inconsequential, so he's telling us, don't look at the content, don't, these myths are, are just pure uh, fantasy, Anderson forces us to pay full attention to the logistics 
and operational mechanics of the system. So it forces us to look at how this, was, this magic was achieved. Second, because it provides us with something akin to this null hypothesis. Just like Portuguese ideology, the Portuguese propaganda system was so uniquely archaic that it implied rely, that it simply relied on the procedure of magic. This turn away from discursive analysis and its focus on syntax and semantics and towards the material, logistics and pre-rational or magic aspects of Portuguese propaganda provides us with the opportunity to engage with the scholarship of the Afro-pessimists, like I presented yesterday already, and Frederick Lorden uh, and, his, and his critic or professor, Alberto Toscano, because they both been commenting on each other. So now, I will begin by presenting uh, the Afro-pessimist critique of, of colonial and imperial ideology. In the last decades, Frank Wilderson III has been advocating, and I'm quoting, for a radical return to Fanon, pointing to the limits of Lacanian psychoanalysis, Foucauldian discourse analysis, and all post-structuralist theories that postulate, quote, that language and more broadly discourse are the modalities that, in the first ontological instance, position the subject structurally. So what he's saying is that all these theories that say that is language that provides the structural oppositions in our society are actually wrong, are not getting the full picture. On the contrary, following Fanon, Wilderson claims that is, it is gratuitous violence that positions the savage and the slave, while it is the freedom from violence's gratuitousness, not from violence itself, that positions the settler or the master. So this means that, you know, while uh, everybody can be subject to violence, when you're in the position, the structural position of being a master or a settler, this violence comes for a reason, it's contingent. You break a law, or you're being robbed, or you are in a war fighting, violence comes to you. While for the, the savage or the slave, no, it's gratuitous, it's pointless. Its point is to institute a difference, for you to be always subject to its gratuitousness. More recently, Wilderson has redefined these two, po these two poles, this polarity, defining the first one as blacks and the second as humans, and proposed that humans, and I'm quoting, are a parasite of black flesh. According to Wilderson, humans experience historical time, quote, the time within the paradigm, founded by gratuitous anti-black violence. Within this paradigm, he claims, the material exploitation of black flesh is framed by political economy as material growth the normal imperial pattern mentioned by Henderson. While the libidinal economy of the state depends on gratuitous anti-black violence, reassuring humans that they are exempt from it. Meaning, according to his view, this is why we keep having these pictures and videos now that police officers carry cameras, we keep having all these images of anti-black violence, gratuitous anti-black violence happening, and this is not stopping them. Quite the contrary, keep getting more and more and more. And faced with this, he comes to this conclusion that this gratuitous violence is actually maintaining society, sustaining society, so it, uh, it somehow refreshes it structurally. And this is what he means by saying that the liberal economy of, of the state or, or society depends on, anti on this anti-black violence continuing. Wilderson's Afro-pessimist critique is important to our analysis because it provincializes the dependence of Portuguese propaganda had on pre-rational, pre-discursive physical operations, stressing the fact that all human ideologies are ontologically grounded on the repetition of gratuitous anti-black violence and the circulation of discourses that imbue anti-white anti violence with meaning. So opposite to this, all violence against whites is presented as meaningful, as historical, as something that is automatically inscribed in linear progressive time. So, a crime against whites or violence against whites can begin a war, can end a war, because you cannot take the toll, for instance, all of that violence has a meaning. From this perspective, the reiteration of the myths of the sacred inheritors and lusotropicalism cater to a universal human psychic need by situating anti-white violence within the historical time and against the backdrop of meaningless, ahistorical, anti-black violence. In Anderson's opinion, in the Portuguese case, this gratuitous violence, and I quote Anderson, immediately or medi immediately, uh, actually or latently, settled on everything and deformed it. 
to the extent that in the end it tended to coincide with the very notion of social relations themselves. So Anderson is writing this in 62, it's almost as if he's an Afro-pessimist himself, he's saying in the Portuguese case violence was so constant that you confuse sociality with this violence. The Afro-pessimists would partly agree with this diagnosis, stressing however that this violence formed, not deformed, social relations and that there is nothing exceptional about the Portuguese case, so they would say this is just business as usual. As João Vargas and Mu Kim Jong put it in their book Anti-Blackness for 2022, anti-blackness provides the ontological condition of possibility of modern world sociality in general, and rather than a real relic, anomaly, or contradiction being gradually overcome, it is foundational to modernity. Therefore, we can immediately reject the first half of our null hypothesis. There was nothing unique or archaic about Portuguese propaganda. Now, we'll proceed to the second part of the critique, which is the communist realist critique of Lorden. During the last decade, on the other hand, Lorden has been proposing a critical approach that Toscano defines as communist realism. As communism really, communist realism, sorry. It is based on a return to Spinoza and an uncompromising anthropological realism, namely the belief that, as Brecht puts it, everything can be made better except man. Besides embracing this harsh anthropological realism, Lorden's theory also accepts that what can be described as institutional realism, accepting the effective morphogenesis of the social that um, guarantees that verticality, so differentiated institutions, will always emerge out of the imminent interplay of the passions of the multitude. So this is a realism that goes against a more optimistic or anarchist or you know, this kind of left, extreme left positions that say that the state will just go away and that you can live without a state. It's very realist. It will say that whenever you are humans, verticality institutions will emerge, so you need to be dealing with it and you need to understand how they work. And therefore, Lorden's communist realism forces us to take into consideration two often neglected nodes in the chain that produces the effective morphogenesis of the social. First, he calls us, tells us to pay attention to the effective mechanisms that drive individual behavior. Second, to what Alberto Toscano describes as the emotional infrastructure of the body politic, or what Lorden describes as the general state, meaning the elementary structure of politics as it exists before any institutional capture. So, all the mechanisms that allow the emotions of people to interact, because it's from this interaction of emotions that some of them will will then um, be elevated temporarily and come back to the multitude imbued with this authority, with this verticality. According to Lorden, the existence of such an infrastructure is already suggested by Spinoza in his theological political theatres, where the philosopher posits the existence, quote, of a sort of mechanism by which the endogenous interplay of the passions rather than the artifices of contract gives rise to the grounding of people, to the grouping of people into political communities. So, deepening this insight by Spinoza, Lorden identifies the emotional infrastructure of the state as the physical dimension where, political, where politics unfolds. So, uh, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to leave the quote as well and proceed. But I'd like to stress this bit here while he says that politics is a factory churning out products of collective affective forces. So, this is his definition of politics. According to Lorden, the products churned out by politics are then perceived by individuals as having a transcendental origin, despite being the result of the imminent interplay of their own passions. In his opinion, it is this paradox, which he describes as the apparent paradox of imminent transcendence, that enables large groups to affect their members and constitute themselves, because the law allows for what in fact comes from the bottom, and is the result of the self-affecting of the multitude, to be perceived and imagined as having all the attributes of coming from the top, namely vertical authority and incommensurable power. So all the emotions play imminently in these spaces, in this emotional infrastructure. Some of them are picked up by leaders, which transmit them back to the multitude, but now with this vertical authority and power. In conclusion, as Toscano clarifies, Lorden claims that states, if, gener if generically understood, are an inevitable product of the multitude's self-constitution, a verticality that cannot but emerge from the multitude's internal communication. So as long as you have a group, you will have a state. 
This product, the Lord and defines as um, potentia multitudinis, is a formidable resource for rulers to exploit. As he explains, by capturing the power of the multitude, individual rulers or privileged parts of the body politic, so elites, reign at the expense of the power of the other parts, borrowing their authority from the multitude by hiding this fact to this paradox of transcendence. To consolidate their hold and influence on the multitude, he asserts, rulers seek to affect the effective mechanisms that drive individual behavior, the ultimate origin of their power. To achieve this end, Lorden concludes, they can either excite the ingenium of individuals, the structure that embodies their habits of feeling, or attempt to modify it in the strong sense, thus altering their very way of being affected, so through more permanent means, education, and whatnot. These two operations, this immediate effect of people and this changing of their ways of being affected, were what Portuguese propaganda sought to accomplish, eliciting immediate effective reactions from the masses and conditioning their ingeniums so that future responses could be easily predicted and triggered. Were its methods akin to incantation or the procedure of magic? So, is this the magic that, uh, that Anderson is talking about? In Lorden's view, sociogenetic effective mechanisms are built from the elementary mechanisms of our effective life. These are, and I'm quoting, too raw and too divorced from the complexity of life, and therefore too abstract, to be concretely observed as such. It is from these elementary mechanisms, and he only names one, which is imitation, he claims, the more complex effective mechanisms emerge, such as the mechanism of confirmation by imitation, so we just imitate our fellow citizens, which enables us to take pride in the actions of others, so to take pride in what the discoverers did five centuries ago, for instance. And soothe our axiological anxieties, so they give us, and he quotes, uh, and I quote, the pleasure in loving and hating together, so all these mechanisms allow us to go through all these emotions, and in the last instance is this that keeps the, the state together. Adopting Lorden's theoretical lenses, it becomes clear that, besides historicizing anti-white violence, the myths of the sacred heritage and lusotropicalism triggered the mechanism of confirmation by imitation, suiting Portuguese axiological anxieties and providing communal pleasure, so they clearly excite the pleasure. In this regard, their effectiveness and the sophistication of the system that circulated them must be assessed by measuring their effective impact, not the realism or their semantic content, nor the complexity of the syntax or the elaboratedness of their distribution system. Of course, that when viewed from outside the fold of the nation, the dispassionate position occupied by Anderson, or vis a vis the Portuguese, all effective operations seem to obey to the rules of magic. It seems magic happening. As Lorden makes us aware, Anderson would have reached the same conclusion if he analyzed any other propaganda system other than the one that he is himself he himself is inserted on. So when we're looking at other people being exposed to nationalism from their own nations, to us it seems magic, it seems irrational, because we are not feeling it. But the point that he's making is this one, it is that the, it is the feeling that creates a the nation, there's nothing outside of the feeling. So now, for instance, we keep criticizing usotropicalism and we keep criticizing this sacred heritage without taking into consideration this emotional impact that they have and that you cannot substitute unless you give another emotionally charged narrative. So, you know, we can rationally be constructed like Anderson did in the 60s, but we will not move past that. <laughs> At least when you're talking to somebody who is inserted in this emotional fold of the state. Now, by now we can fully discard our hypothesis and conclude that the Portuguese propaganda system was not uniquely archaic and that the methods it employed to circulate colonial ideology were not particularly eccentric. Taking stock of Lorden and Wilderson's insights, I proceed to describe the contours of the emotional infrastructure that those in charge of it sought to capture and instrumentalize. Afterwards, I will investigate how these psychological operation officers were trained to trigger the effective mechanisms of individuals. So now I'm going to go something more concrete. I'm going to look at the, at the structure of, the, of, the, of this emotional infrastructure. So in 1961, Donas Boto, uh, a major of the army, 
wrote the paper Psychological Warfare, Political Warfare, Propaganda, as part of his coursework for a general staff course. It is based on a review of British and North American literature about the propaganda systems of the United Kingdom and the Soviet Union. So this is the images that he does of the General Organization of the Government Information Services of the UK, and this is the Soviet one, so it was paying close attention to, to the systems. In a note accompanying the copy of the paper that he sent to Salazar, Donas Botu admits that by forwarding it to the dictator, he intended not only to inform him about the significance of these topics, so psychological warfare and political warfare, but also to lobby for the creation of a new central intelligence organization, so a Portuguese CIA of sorts. In his opinion, faced with the need to mobilize the Portuguese society for war, and this is just to give you the idea, this is the budget with defense in the 60s, from 61 onwards, as you can see, just skyrockets. Uh, the National what Bureau... the small ones? The small ones... Uh... Uh, it's not important, we should focus on the... Okay, no, yeah, yeah, no, 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 okay. No, okay I, I think I cut it, but it's like the, 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 um, it's the different branches of the military, okay. so it should be like um, Navy, uh, Air Force, uh, and the Army. But I can, I can go, we can go no, back. No, 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 it's fine. It's <laughs> just, <laughs> but yeah, it's, just, it's <laughs> it a good point. That, uh, uh, in his opinion, faced with the need to mobilize Portuguese society for war, the National Bureau of Information, Popular Culture and Tourism, SNI, the, 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 how it was known, uh, and it, this was the institutional head of the National Bureau of Propaganda, instituted by Antonio Ferro in 33 to 44, this this knee had become utterly ineffective. As Dona Bo Donas Boto puts it, by then, it only gathered information in popular culture, but it turned out nothing but bad tourism. To fix this situ situation, he proposed to Salazar the creation of a National Ministry of Information, headed either by an adjunct Prime Minister or a Minister of Information. According to the organigram, Donas Boto and access to his report, and this is something that we already discussed yesterday, because it does this graph of the whole infrastructure that he wanted to capture for his new Portuguese CIA. Now, according to this organigram, the new ministry was to have liaison with four other organisms. So it was to be composed by a State Department or General Directorate of Foreign Affairs, headed by an ambassador, a State Department or General Directorate of Security, headed by a flag officer of the armed forces, a State Department, or Third Division of the Ministry of Information, headed by a university rector, or, um, or at least a um, uh, dean. Yeah. And uh, a State Department, or Fourth Division of the Ministry of Information, dedicated to tourism and migration, headed by a chief, exec a chief executive officer, or um, a State Department, for the, from the State Department for Trade. So, you can see that you know, this is one of the, the four branches on top. Additionally, Donas Boto recommends that the new ministry inherited all the functions of the SNI, thus working with the International Colonization Authority, the Internal Colonization Authority, the regional and international boards, authorities and commissions in charge of tourism, migration and industry, the Casas de Portugal, and the commercial attaches and liaison agents that were embedded with the Portuguese diasporas throughout the world. So it was a very complete hold on the, the whole society. To better coordinate the psychological war efforts, Donas Boto suggested that representatives from the Ministry of Information met daily with representatives from the overseas governments, the Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Finally, he proposed that three dedicated staff officers, one colonel and two lieutenant colonels, and one Air Force officer, all trained in psychological warfare, should be permanently stationed at each of the headquarters of the commanding staff that were stationed overseas. There, the officers were to advise the commanding officer and instruct the units responsible for circulating the propaganda approved by the resident political advisor, who was to establish a direct liaison with the, with the ministry. So as you see, it's, it's a far cry from magic. We're not dealing with magic, we're dealing with a brutal infrastructure. Donas Boto's detailed organigram allows us to chart, to chart the sections of the emotional infrastructure of the Portuguese general state that he hoped to capture and understand their place in the larger picture. According to his own terminology, some of the institutions and individuals charted were supposed to collect information. For instance, social science researchers, hoteliers, and the different policies, policies, polices 
and internal authorities, which would then be processed by the Ministry of Information and turned into propaganda circulated either by the PSYOPs units or the civilian organisms mentioned in his organigram. For instance, the university professors, the late host players at the universities, but also the radio show hosts, TV presenters and whatnot. These circuits would create the illusion of verticality in doing the effect-laden information that the ministry transmitted back to the multitude with an aura of authority and commonality. And from the same period, 61, we have this list of topics that concern the Portuguese. It's called like that. Salazar had it, a folder. And it's a folder of seven pages with topics that concern the Portuguese. That had uh, loaded with emotions that they could use for this. I didn't bring it, but, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, um, how do you say, it's a very psychedelic document because some of the things that were concerning the Portuguese were that people from Porto were very rude. <laughs> some other things were like the perception that they have of the children being barefoot on the street, the foreigners. Some of, so, so small bits of information that were collected were emotionally charged and if you needed to do something like a, you know, a, a spin doctor to change the topic of discussion in public, you can just use them. So this kind of this kind of information was being, uh, was being collected. So, according to Donish Boto, two additional stratagems in-house enhanced this aura of authority. First, censoring institutions guaranteed that the circulation of inopportune effects, so emotions that were negative, was disrupted. And second, by adopting different channels to communicate the emotions back to the masses, the Ministry of Information and the psy officers assured that only positive emotions were associated with the new state, reinforcing its authority and the capture of the general state. Finally, Donish Bote explained to Salazar that some of the institutions he mapped were better equipped to conduct what he defines as operations of consolidation, long-term psychological operations designed to permanently modify the way of feeling of individuals. For instance, the university departments, the industrial and commercial associations and the Casas de Portugal, while others could only attain ephemeral results, like pamphlets of radio shows, so he was telling me. Different institutions will give you different results. Despite the comprehensiveness of Donas Boto's organigram and paper, he is the first one to admit that he only partially maps the emotional infrastructure of the Portuguese general state. On the one hand, because in his opinion, some of the effects that emerged from the potential multitudinous were invariably captured by the political adversaries of the new state, namely the communists who agitated, according to him, the working masses and the university students. So here is a clear element of Paranoia is thinking that the Soviet Union is managing to enter the minds of the Portuguese youth. Well, anyway, it's Cold War epistemology, I guess. On the other hand, because the organigram doesn't list a single institution arising from the blacks, from black multitudes' internal communication, not even the few state-recognized clubs and guilds with black assimilated associates or the traditional authorities co-opted by the colonial state, so they're never included. No emotions were collected and no emotions were thrown back at them. As Donas Boto put, puts it, the Portuguese had, quote, little knowledge of the psychology of some African tribes, and communication with their members was difficult by their supposed illiteracy and the lack of trusted specialists about these tribes. This way of framing the limits of the emotional infrastructure that Donas Boto hoped to capture is symptomatic of a, of, is symptomatic of a deeper truth. In fact, blacks, contrary to white dissidents and communists, were never truly considered part of the body politic, and therefore they were not allowed to contribute to the common effective pool, the potential multitudinous that was tapped by propaganda officers. Instead, black individuals in the new, that the new state classified either as assimilados or indigenous were imagined as mere passive receptacles of the effects transmitted by psyop units and other propaganda agents and violence, of course, the receptacles of Rezutu's violence. Therefore, the odds of black individuals experience the, emotional, the emotions targeted back at them as imbued with legitimate verticality and authority were very slim. And all the sociogenetic, mimetic pleasures extended to white Portuguese, so the pride in, in, in taking, you know, taking pride in the actions of others, the discoveries, the pleasure in loving and hating together, all these mechanisms were denied to black populations. Furthermore, as Lorden would have put it, in colonial contexts, the black majority was also denied the pleasure, pleasurable prerogative of taking decisions, so they were never allowed to take any, a situation that further unbalanced the colonial border politic. Now, on 1964, 
the MPLA released a counter propaganda pamphlet directed specifically at the, it was titled Against the Colonial Propaganda of the Portuguese. And they picked exactly these facts and rhetorically asked its readers why, and this is a quote, in a land with many races that was like a garden with many different colored flowers, only one was allowed to command, enjoy the products of the land and flourish. So MPLA also picks this, this kind of propaganda saying, why are we not having any of these supposed pleasures of this land that many? Now, last bit, <laughs> how were these psychological officers trained to affect the affected mechanisms of individuals? In a circular letter from 17 November 1960, so before the events of the UPA in the north of Angola, Colonel Manuel Pimenta Gudinho, Chief of Staff of the Military Command of Angola, admitted the urgent need for ad hoc psychological warfare measures. They didn't have a budget, but he said we need to do something. Now, this was before the UPA uprisings, but was during the, the crisis, the labor crisis, that ended up with the massacres in the, in the cotton fields of Cotonang, in which the, the, the Portuguese used Napalm to, to punish the, the population. Consequently, the colonel ordered the start of three types of actions, of operations. A psychological operation to conquer African souls, a social operation to conquer African hearts, an educational operation to conquer African minds. This is how he puts it. The first, Goudinho explained, consisted in countering the rumors spread by enemy propaganda by talking more gently to African populations. This is what he says, you should just be gentle. <laughs> While they were using Apollo, of course. Uh, the second consisted in sharing surplus rations and medication with African populations, experience extreme malnutrition or dire sanitary conditions. And the third measure in establishing improved, improvised grammar schools for African kids and grown-ups, promoting sports competitions and gymnastics, and organizing patriotic festivals for retired African soldiers. In the end, the only budget that was allocated to these operations was destined to be spent buying cigarettes and candies to bribe Africans into participating in the sports events and educational programs. So this is the budget. Literally, it says that we need to conquer minds and everything, but in the end it just gives money to buy candy. This is psychological operations in the 1960, before the UPA. A year later, things changed dramatically. In 1961 alone, the Portuguese Air Force brutally repressed with napalm bombs a peasant uprising at the Baixa de Cacenge from December to March, 60, December 1960 to March 61. So a couple of months after this distribution of candies. Eric Galvão hijacked the Santa Maria in January, coordinated Assaults on the prisons and military headquarters of Luanda resulted in hundreds of blacks being lynched as a reprisal, so the events of 4th of February, and a bloody insurgency orchestrated by Oldham Roberto and the uh, Union das Populações de Angola took place in the northwestern provinces of Angola from the 15th to the 18th of March. Ghana filed a complaint against Portugal in the United Nations in February, and Goa was liberated by the Indian Union in December. So 61 is clearly a bad year for the regime. On the wake of these events, dedicated staff officers began to be trained in psychological warfare, just as Donas Boto had suggested, so then they took him seriously. The nine-hour course they received in the Luda province, province of Angola is summarized in nine instruction sheets that have survived the war and are now part of the Antonio Soares Carneiro Archival Fund, which is available at the Portuguese National Archive. The PSYOPS course probably altered between 1968 and 72, with the supervision, the supervision of Suárez Carneiro, drew inspiration from an astonishing variety of sources, from the works of Goebbels, Mao and Lenin, to the Soviet methods inspired by Pavlovian conditioning, American behaviorism, Freudian psychoanalysis, Dewey's philosophy, and Jungian analytical psychology. So, it was eclectic. Its eclecticism and bricolore ethos are fully aligned with the emergent postmodernism of the era and reveal that the army didn't balk at grounding its psychological operations on highly speculative theories and non overlapping and often conflicting systems. So, what is amazing of this, of this series of shit is that uh, they pick pieces from all these theories, from very opposed regimes, very opposed thought systems, they put it all together. They're very postmodern and they're very cutting edge. In that regard, I mean, even when they're using theories that are 20 or 30 years old, the way they combine it is very postmodern. 
So they bring to mind, and I was commenting that yesterday, the adoption of the Israeli army nowadays of contemporary theory and cutting edge artworks as an inspiration for, to inspire their uh, urban warfare tactics. So in the late 60s, the Portuguese army was also using all this theory to better fight this psychological war. From the onset, the training sheets clarified that the ideal target of psychological operations is an hypothetical mass man. A subject without values, alienated from the traditional structures of family, village and, re and region, according to the first sheet, it is the effective mechanism of imitation that allows mass men to be bound together by common effects, despite their physical dispersion and alienation from traditional structures. Imitation, therefore, is identified by the sheet as the effective driving force of mass modern societies. This effective mechanism made mass men easily influenceable the sheet informs the trainees, because while they only have ideas that were suggested to them, they are convinced that they are in fact their authors. The first training sheet ends by claiming that mass men only think through images or slogans that free them from thinking, and long to belong to a party or a group and submit to the authority of a leader to have their anxiety soothed. Because of these two tendencies, the sheet concludes, the subconscious had become the most important part of the psychic structure of modern man. Hence, following the following five sheets, glean the methods deployed by the Soviet Pavlovian, Pavlov <laughs> ah, the school of Pavlov as it was applied in the Soviet Union, Hitlerian Freudian methods, whatever that means, and North American Jungian schools, and they use all these methods to trigger and condition the subconscious of this mass man. Now, the Soviet system is unpacked by the second training sheet, which focuses on the different basic instincts identified by Pavlov, and explains that reflexes can be conditioned to be triggered as neutral stimuli, and thus become signs. When discussing what neutral stimuli were to be chosen by the psychological officer, operation officers, the author of the sheet begins to speculate associating the Pavlovian sign with the Christian verb or the Greek logos and claiming that all words have two components, a meaning and a power that was stronger in some words like abracadabra. Now, could you not? Then he starts discussing several words and saying these are more powerful than others, never explaining why. So here we are back to, the, to magic. Therefore, the author concludes, when targeting the subconscious, the meaning of a word is useless only their power is effective. This level of speculation and lack of scientific grounding also comes to characterize the content of the next training sheets, the third dedicated brief to briefly unpacking what he calls Hitlerian Freudianism, before discussing what it is described as the North American Jungian method, which occupies the fourth and fifth, and fifth sheets. So they have a preference for Jungian methods. Of Freudian theory, the author only mentions the tripartite structure of the mind, describing the id as an effective abyss, the bottomless source of all instincts, and immediately after this, asserting the, or telling the trainees that there is a collective unconscious, enigmatically claiming that this general unconscious, and I quote them, like the bottom of a lake, is constituted by ground rock, a piece of the earth. After making this gnomic assertion, which you never show what it means, uh, the author says that the individual unconscious of a Chinese is, at birth, different from the, unconsci the unconscious of an Eskimo, and that the collective unconscious is not a hive mind, but the sum of, and I quote, all the elements shared by all because they establish a psychic reality that precedes personal experience. These shared elements, the third sheet concludes, come into modalities archetypes that are expressed as myths, and the sacred, which can be experienced either as the positive sacred, the numinous, that is associated with festivals and with festas, or the negative, the sase, which is associated with war. Now, all of this becomes very abstract, because it moves from talking about magic words to talking about this psychic unconscious, defining these groups of people with different ones that you gain at birth because it comes to you from the earth and the landscape and this is training uh, soldiers. So. 
And here, for instance, he's, he's talking about the different elements of the sacred in the, in the US, <laughs> the, the different elements in the, US, in the Soviet Union, in France. And then always the question, what about Portugal? What, what, is, what, we, what can we use in Portugal? The fourth sheet then provides the trainees with some examples of archetypes, describing them as primordial Im images that emerge in the unconscious and are shared by everybody with the same oniric conscience whatever that means once again. For example, the hero, the color red and fire, the serpent, dragons, all of these supposedly are shared by everybody, and the propagandists should use them. This sheet concludes by claiming that the shared nature of these archetypes explains why individuals are less resistant to propaganda when gathered in dark places around bonfires, a fact that the PSYOPs officers were told to explore. So we give a bunch of examples of Nazi meetings and saying, look, what is working here is the dark, lends the fire, brings people together. We use this in the Museo Portuguesa, it works very good, try to do this a lot. Sheet 5 proceeds to describe three laws ruling the application of myths. A law of simplification or stratification, the law of repetition or orchestration, and the law of derivation and suggestion. According to its author, operations based on the law of simplification consist in adapting myths to different discursive modalities, each targeted at specific social strata. So, according to him, myth-inspired doctrines are targeted leaders, while programs at elites, slogans at groups, and symbols at the masses. So this is the scheme that he shows the, the people being instructed. You have uh, the same myth, but then you have to simplify it according to the strata of society that you're targeting. The need to adapt the myths, the shit claims, stems from the fact that ordinary people, quote, are too lazy to follow complex lines of thought, and therefore happily accept simple explanations. As for the operations based on the law of repetition and orchestration, according to the author, they consist in repeating the same myths to the limits of obsession. Taking care in con limits of obsession is actually the word that he uses, taking care in conveying them through different kinds of symbols. So, visual, auditive, kinetic, so performative. I would say, in order for you not to lose your audience, because people are rejecting it from hearing it so, so often, you should use different medium and slide up and down, so you target with doctrine, target with this one. This to avoid resistance and rejection. Finally, Sheet 5 clarifies that the operations based on the law of derivation and suggestion consist in changing the course of public debates by suggesting alternative topics with a strong emotional charge. Is what we the, today we call whataboutism. So you're having a discussion, ah, oh, what about that? No. So <laughs> he was saying that that should be used and you should have these lists of emotions ready at hand because something happens, you just change the topic. After the session based on this shift, the PSYOPs the psy officers training concluded with a three-hour session detailed in sheet seven to nine. This describes the characteristics and logistics involved in using different means that circulate propaganda, for instance, how to do a radio program, how to do a billboard, how the trucks that had the loudspeakers should be circulating, constantly lamenting that the Portuguese could not afford the most effective means, like cinema and, other, and television. Now, to conclude, uh, I would say that a close reading of these archival documents suggests an alternative hypothesis to substitute our rejected null. So according to this alternative, the Portuguese propaganda system was chronically underfunded and relied on a highly speculative, postmodern cocktail of Pavlovian, Freudian and Jungian inspired theories. Now, I have another part for this presentation, which was a bit what I described yesterday, showing the, the, the posters that they actually distributed in the Lunders. I don't think I'm going to read it or follow it because I think that I exceed the time, right? Okay. It's up to you, okay? Yeah, but, it's 3.30 now, we still have time if you So, can. because yesterday, or maybe I can do it in a different kind of format. Yesterday, since we could not show PowerPoints, I actually painted some of the posters. Oh, I can, I, for, for the viewers, I can just put them there. Yeah. So I printed these three posters. These were the three versions of the same poster that these PSY officers did as a draft, and they were discussing which one to distribute in the in the Lundas. And uh, yesterday I came, and, and this is the third part, I think that 
despite having all these discussions about the, sem the, the semiotics or the, all the symbolic elements of this propaganda, what in the end I think they keep on going back to is this gratuitous anti-black violence because first, and this is from Lorden's theory, this is inevitable because they are not collecting the emotions of the local black population. So the black populations never actually take play, uh, have their emotions play imminently in this imminent play of emotions from where something will rise. So the Portuguese are literally not hearing what is happening there. And then when they decide to transmit something back, what they end up always transmitting is the same gratuitous violence that founds the racial system. So yesterday I was saying that here, you can see that they were trying to decide what color was better or not, but the whole composition is profoundly anti-black. The first reason why I think it's anti-black has to do with the fact that they, you present the Chokwe mask, and this mask for the Chokwe would not be a mask, it would be an entity, an ancestor, a living entity that will not be only be material, but it will also be um, a presence, a, a non-tic non uh, being. Well, here, what you have is a reproduction of an object that is already the result of violence, of being severed from their culture, put in the museum, in this case, the Dundu Museum, from the Diamond Company, which is in this province of the Lunda, northeast Angola, another huge collection of chocolate art. So, this museum, and Nuno Porto has been working about it since 2009, at least, uh, had this rhetoric of being the, the, the safe house of, of chocolate culture. So the Portuguese were always presenting themselves as the protectors and the defenders of this traditional culture. But of course, the way that they were preserving this culture is already a dead object. They're collecting dead objects. They're collecting something that is violently seized from the populations. But here, clearly, the officers believed that the, the populations they were targeted would not see the difference, so that they would look at this mask and come rally to the Portuguese because the, the NBLA, UPA and UNITA movements would be uh, a threat to their own culture. So there's this degree of um, hallucination from the side of the Portuguese. And also on the second element, yesterday I was, talk, I was comparing this, this image to the pamphlets and to this event, which is the the fact that the same SNI, the, the Propaganda Bureau, in the aftermath of the, of the events in the north of Angola, the UPA uprising of 15 to 18 March of 61, distributed these booklets, Death on the March in Angola, with the atrocity photographies, you know, so the photographies of mutilated bodies. Right? And, uh, and what I say is that if you see what's happening here, you also have these black faces being grouped together on top of the mask in two of the compositions and being opposed to this severed arm and all of this composition just portrays a white or a colonial ordering of this severed black flesh the representation of it why? because uh, it was slavery it was this colonial institution that separated the reproductive labor of women and children on one side from the productive labor of men that were first sold in the transatlantic slave trade and then began being sent as contract labor to St. Thomas and Prince, to the mines in South Africa and from Mozambique. And somehow these men that had been alienated and created and gendered, uh, this division of labor was gendered, was created by this by the, by the slavery. These men were the ones now coming back as guerrilla fighters. And the Portuguese, who, who created the situation by doing this severing and imposing this slavery, is that I said, are showing this to the populations as if they are the ones preventing it. So all of this, whoever was doing this there at the psychological operations and was trying to use these tools of Jungian psychology, Pavlovian, whatever, to decide the colors and the shapes and what symbols to put, clearly failed to see that what they were transmitting was their own anti-blackness and the anti-black violence that was grounding the system back at the populations. So I'm not surprised that this didn't go anywhere. But when and they were failing, or, I, I'm not getting this, this argument, oh, well. they were failing 
or it was intentional? The I think that I think that looking at the manuals and, uh, and all the notes that able to do this, I think that it was not this was not meant to alienate the people. This was meant to have the chakra come to the army. And but I, I, I lost something important. I'm sorry if I am, a, but uh, we are not many here. I, oh. I, I didn't get to where this image come from because oh. I was in the seminar. I was not in the seminar. Oh, sorry. No, 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 sorry. And, 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 no, no, no. I need to, yes, and I need to to, to talk to the viewers as well. This this image was distributed by the psychological officers that were being trained in the Lundas okay. by that manual. So after the training, this also belongs to the same archive, they were discussing which one of these pamphlets to distribute to the population, okay. trying to figure which of these compositions according to the color, the shape, the, the size of the of the images and the arm, was better targeted at the, at the Lunda chakra population. Now, if I go and read this posters through the lenses that are provided by the theories explaining the sheets. What you have here is a discussion if red triggers this in the mind or if this symbol of the ancestors will make you you know this according to those theories the Portuguese here are saying look the MPLA, UNITA, UPA are a threat to your traditional way of life represented by the mask of the ancestor, they are a threat to your social reproduction, the women and the children, they were but all of this symbolic discourse that they were training to, to, to aim at people clearly doesn't take into consideration that what is being represented is actually acts of gratuitous anti-black violence. So for the white officers, this is ticks all the boxes. Yeah, the ancestor, they are targeting the ancestor, oh they're targeting the women and everything. But if you look at what how they figure, how they portray the ancestor, what they're portraying is this mask that was taken. This is not the. I mean, this is not even a representation of the full body costume of this ancestor. But even that will be a reduction because this ancestor is, is a luminous presence. It's a living, yeah. sentient being. And the fact that they are taking for granted that this will target the population shows to what extent they were not taking into consideration the emotions of, the, of this black population. So, in a way, despite all its... Um, and I would not say that this is magic like Benedict Anderson was saying, because clearly it was, all the system was, was, was very conscious that they were putting a lot of labor into this, you know, to, do, to discover how, how to get information, how to process, how to manage, how to train these officers. But in the end, this goes all down to the Afro-pessimist critique. Since the blacks were not considered part of the body politic, everything that was being targeted back at them is just things that, um, that are grounded on white emotions and all these cycles. And then uh, um, the way that you interface with these populations is by showing this kind of anti-black violence and expecting a different reaction. I mean, uh, we don't have uh, a, a written archive of the reaction of people in the era to these specific posters, but what we do have from the archives of the PLA is that uh, clearly Portuguese propaganda was not uh, was not uh, passing the, the 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 intended emotions. If we go to some of the writings of Emilio Cartagal, we actually discovered that the previous one, the non-elaborated propaganda of the schools, the cigarettes, and the candies, was actually having a better impact. So. Milka Cabral was more worried about that, about, uh, about the non-elaborated fact of you being somehow kinder to people and handing cigarettes and candy because that's something tangible. You can understand that people then could use the cigarettes to barter for other stuff as, as currency or the candies are candies. I mean, who doesn't love candies? But when they go more elaborated and put all of these things, and uh, I'm trying to show in this presentation how this infrastructure was thought about and how it was set in place, and then how they train the people to, to cause this, to trigger this, these mechanisms. I argue, and uh, I would be arguing it a bit longer if, if we had more time, perhaps more clearly, that what you actually have is representations of anti-black violence, the thing that reassure the Portuguese being thrown back at black populations. The thing of the atrocity exhibition is interesting because, and as I elaborated yesterday, it shows both black bodies and white bodies being disfigured, but only the white bodies are worn that come to, to take a place in history. And the way that these bodies are shown is also differentiated. So in Portugal and everywhere else, you're showing both black bodies and white bodies, and the white bodies are saying, these are martyrs, we need to go there, start the war, and da, da, da. The black bodies are always fungible, they're just there on the background, providing the background. Well, 
when the marine, marines, yeah, I think we can translate them as them, both marines and, and the army goes to Angola, they're shown only the pictures of white bodies and they are told to now go and do something to black bodies. So somehow they are shown only the white bodies massacred and this triggers in them the reaction to reproduce this violence. And the violence that came after the, the, these images in 61 was, was horrendous, was tremendous. And, um, and also the fact that even today you keep using images of those mutilated black bodies to illustrate other massacres and other chronologies, so they, are, they, they remain fungible. So you can totally see that um, there's this difference. And that these pamphlets and these atrocities trigger white emotions in a way, they trigger action, they, they make you want to defend this sacred heritage and all this nationhood and, and whatnot. And, uh, and I would argue that uh, white people seeing these pamphlets can understand its symbols, can understand that this is, a, this is an argument saying that the Portuguese can, can defend the ancestors, that they can defend the women and children, that these are somehow pacifists. But for a black person, what they would be immediately triggering would be this, this, this separation and uh, gender division of labor that was imposed by slavery, and that caused a huge amount of suffering. In fact, the, the uprisings in the uprisings in Baixa de Cassange in 1961 were caused partially by this. Women were being forced to 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 also um, uh, plant cotton and tend the cotton fields. There was no time even to plant food and to grow food, so people were starving. So all of this, all of this separation, all of this is 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 also mentioned by the symbols. But I don't believe that the officers were seeing it. I think that they were just too much lost in their own labyrinth, I guess. Thank you so much, uh, sure. Jean.